Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. Okay, so this will be the <clears throat> this will be the last lecture, the last new math topic we're going to have, and we're going to meet in the lab from now on, uh, because uh, as for writing new programs, oh, that thing's off. As for the writing programs for new math topics, we don't need to learn anything new, I think. And the rest of them will be things like uh, plotting. Uh, so we'll have a few nice uh, applications about plotting. But you know everything there is to know about plotting sine and cosine. I don't. This is not a a, a topic that we need to go over. Uh, but <coughs> it will be a good skill for you to have to be able to plot sine and cosine and things like this uh, in MATLAB. Okay. <coughs> So, uh, the last topic, what's today, the 16th? So, so uh, the last topic we're going to introduce is um, about factoring integers. Okay, so factoring integers is, is uh, uh, an extremely important topic in modern, in modern society in, in, in the end. The reason is because, uh, well, isn't it nice that you can log on to your bank's web page and, and, and do your banking online or, or buy things from, from Amazon or, or what have you, and you don't have to worry uh, about, about third parties being able to say, oh, there's, a, there's Johnny Smith's credit card information. Terrific. I think I'll make my own purchase. Uh, with that information. So uh, a, a significant part of being able to do this, so, so the general idea of being able to send messages that third parties can't uh, interpret, what's the name for that? Encryption. Encryption, right? So uh, the, way, the way it uh, actually works and, and the, the reason why um, <coughs> the reason why uh, in, in, encryption, encryption is uh, a, a useful tool. Is because factoring integers is difficult. In the end, that's that's the underlying reason, the thing that makes uh, all <laughs> all encryption work. So uh, here's a, an observation that I'll make uh, from from abstract algebra. Now I know that. Um, that many of you have not taken abstract algebra. That's fine. Uh, this, what I'm going to say, will be uh, more or less self-contained. So uh, I want you to consider the set Zn. So that's Z as in the, uh, the integers the way we denote the integers, but with subscript n, <coughs> uh, with the operation, and so, so in particular, the, the set of elements is uh, 0, 1, 2, up to uh, n minus 1. <coughs> and we're going to use, uh, using the operation Uh, if we have two two elements in here, we'll say that uh, a plus b. When, when I'm sorry. Can you make it by less bright? Less bright. Let me see if I can. These aren't on. Uh, right now. When I put my when I put my highly re reflective hand up there, <laughs> okay. So now these lights are on. Is it any better? A little better. Okay. So using the operation a <coughs> plus b uh, to 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 perform this operation, what we'll actually do. So I'll I'll call the 
the operation circled plus and the way that we'll actually calculate it is that we'll compute the regular sum of a and b that is to say in in the way that you would do integers uh, and then we'll calculate this result modulo uh, modulo n so uh, well let's have an example so for example uh, we could consider uh, say z6 Z6 is the set of what elements? Zero to five. Zero to five. So zero, one, two, three, four, five. And I, I could take various, <coughs> very, various elements in here, and I could say, well, uh, for example, what is one and then funny plus two? So one funny plus two is? Well, it's three. three. It's three. So so far, it kind of works just like, just like plus. Uh, s similarly, how about uh, how about what is two funny plus uh, five? Uh, two pl funny plus three. Five. So 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 far so good. Okay, now it now it gets weird. Uh, how about what is uh, what is three funny plus four? Not two. One. It's going to be one. Okay. So now let's let's see why. So so these just worked out. <laughs> they just they just sort of worked out. Uh, to calculate this one, well, that means that we need to do three plus four. That is to say, in the nor in the normal way, and then we have to do this uh, modulo uh, six because we're talking about z six. So so <coughs> uh, this would be seven modulo six. But what is, what is the remainder of 7 uh, divided by 6? It's 1, right? Its quotient is 1, and its remainder is 1. So this would be uh, 1. So that is to say 3 funny plus 4 is, in, in this set, equal to, uh, in, according to this set and this operation, uh, equal to 1. Yes? Right, yeah. Okay, so uh, that, that's interesting. Um, so here, here's, here's also uh, something notable. Uh, so how about, um, how about one funny plus five? That'd be, that'd be zero, that's interesting. Okay, so now we add two things together, uh, and you know you may be accustomed to them being the the, the addition of one and five uh, should should be not zero, yet in this situation it's zero. Okay, well um, this is actually not 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 so strange of a situation. We deal with this all the time. Uh, well, a, re a, a related occurrence anyway. So how about um, if we use if we use 24 hour time by the way the united states is one of the few civilized countries that you <laughs> that uses uh that uses tw uh, 12 hours split in two so uh now what is when someone says it's uh 15 o'clock what does that mean to us it mean it means three it means three okay uh well if it's 15 o'clock if it's 15 o'clock and then seven, seven hours elapse, uh, what time is it in the, in the 24 hour reckoning? It, it'd be 22 o'clock, okay? What if, what if uh, it's 15 o'clock and nine hours elapse? Then it's zero o'clock, right? It's zero o'clock. So what's happening, what's happening is that the hours anyway, the hours in this system are, are being computed in, in what set? Z24. Similarly, similarly, uh, if you have a ceiling fan, and this is my artist rendition of a ceiling fan there. <clears throat> if you have a ceiling fan, we all know 
that essentially every ceiling fan has, has the possibility to be off, the low setting, the medium setting, and the high setting, right? So that's how, that's how the thing works. So what if, what if you are here? What if you're at the high setting and you say, ah, high is too much right now. I need it to be on medium. Then what do you have to do? You gotta go to off first. Right, you've gotta make, you've gotta make three clicks. You gotta do click, click, click. Uh, so if you do three clicks, uh, that, that takes you to the, to the medium setting. But what I want you to, to uh, realize is that it, in this sense, three uh, is, is some sense equivalent to negative one. Because if you wanted to move one backward, the way that you achieve that is moving three forward. Okay. So now that we have kind of, kind of this idea uh, like this, Mm, I want to point something out specific about uh, Z6. So again, considering Z6. Again, considering this, this situation. Mm, I want you to consider, uh, let, let, let's consider how about uh, all multiples of five. And by multiples, I mean co consecutive additions of, of, uh, of five, funny additions. So in particular, uh, well, we have five, of course. That's taking, doing no funny additions. And then what would, what would five plus five give you? That'd be four. Okay, then how about uh, five plus five plus five? What does that give you? That's gonna be three. And five plus five plus five, how many do I have? Four plus five, all funny pluses. So what's this going to be? Two. Uh, what's the next one going to be, by the way? One. <laughs> and the next, next one? Zero. So do, do, you, do you observe, do you observe that um, taking, just, taking just multiples of five, we were able to hit everything that's in Zn. And, and as it happens, we happen to enumerate them in reverse order. There's nothing special about that. Nothing, nothing that I want to draw out of draw out to that but what I want you to see is we w we were able to hit everything that's in uh, that's in Z6 yes <laughs> yes well yes I mean we could we could say we could say let's let's define let's define funny funny product so and this uh, as uh, up for uh, what am I trying to say on Zn like uh, a funny product B is so this is this is something in th these are both somethings in Z6 this would mean uh, B uh, no not not circle B <laughs> carried away with the circles there. <coughs> uh, so B funny add B funny add dot 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 funny add and then how many of these would I have to make? A of them, right? So A of these. So so in that sense, uh, you how, how could we express this one say? Yeah, this would be four Funny product, five. And then wh uh, what this would mean? What this would mean is the way you could calculate this in your head is that well, if it wasn't if it wasn't funny product, four times five is twenty, and then you do this modulo six, and you get <coughs> two. Okay, good. So what I want you to see is that is that you can consider multiples of five, and you end up covering all of all of Z six. 
Okay. Uh, let's consider uh, let's consider all multiples of two. So I guess since we went ahead and defined the the funny funny product there, I could say okay. Well, we have two, which would which I which I, by that I mean one funny product two. Uh, how about how about uh, two funny product two? What's that? That'd be four. And then uh, three funny product two. That's zero. Ah, interesting. <coughs> Uh, and then uh, four funny product two. What's that? That's two. Okay, so I've got all that written there. Do, do you observe that, that we did two and then four and then zero and then two? What would come next? Four and then zero and then two. Are we able to reach all of the elements inside of Z6 if we start with two? And, and consider all multiples. We're not. We're not going to be able to reach all of them. So in particular, we're never going to reach one. We're never going to get to one. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, so if we consider uh, Zn and we consider it, we consider it with this funny plus as we defined it. What's the name for this structure? I'm fishing for a G word, those of you who've taken algebra. Group, yeah. This is a group. Is a group. Uh, and one of the, one of the, uh, one of the main things that you want to do in group theory is you want to figure out, well, are there any subgroups? So in particular, if we consider, uh, so we, we want a subgroup. So I'm trying to avoid these t too many technical details because I know you all haven't taken algebra yet. But to, il to, to illustrate my point, what I want you to observe is that if we had Z6, which is the set of all elements, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, with uh, with funny addition being regular addition modulo 6, then uh, if you consider the set, <coughs> if you consider the set uh, A equal to 0, 2, 4, then do you observe that that's a proper subset of Z6 in the first place? <coughs> and in the second place, uh, consider all, I I any pairs of these. Take any two pairs of numbers, take any pair of numbers and then, and then funny add them together. Do you notice that you never leave this set? So like zero plus two, zero funny plus two is zero. Uh, two funny plus two is four. Zero funny plus zero is zero. How about four funny plus four? That's two. And then four funny plus six, that's zero. You'll never leave. You never leave. So this is a, this is a subgroup. Uh, are there any other subgroups? Uh, well, let, let's, let's think about that. Let's consider the set. Uh, b so this, this is a subgroup. Subgroup. And let's write 1, 3, 5. So the question is, the question is, is that can you take all, can you take any pair? Yeah. Well, but let, but it's good. Let's, let's see why. Let's see why. So is, is this a subgroup? So let's, let's consider. Uh, what if we take one and three and then funny add them together? Well, what is the funny addition of one and three? Four. <coughs> is that in here? It's not. So, so the, the sort of the, the, what am I trying to say? The, the red flag dead giveaway is, is you could keep taking one, right? You could take one and one and get two. And then you could take one and two and get three, and then one and three and, and get four. OK, so this is not a subgroup. OK, so let's try another one. 
So can it? Well, so zero in what number? Can you? So give me a specific one. Zero and five. Well, that won't work because uh, because you because you can take an element twice, right? So zero and zero. That would that would give you zero. Zero and five. That would give you five. But five and five. That'd be 10, modulo 6 would be 4. So now you've got a new one. OK, so, so this isn't one, but we're getting closer all the time. So how about, are there any other? Yes? Zero and three. Zero and three. OK, let's see if that's right. OK, so if we, take, if we select 0 twice, 0 funny add 0, that's 0. Uh, 0 funny add 3, that's? three, we still haven't left, and three funny add three, that's zero. Because, because, th because three regular add three is six, and then modulo six is zero. Ah, so this is a subgroup. This is a subgroup. Uh, there's one other subgroup. What is it? Zero. Yeah, the, the set that contains only zero. Right, because, uh, well, Let's take, let's take two things from here. How about zero and zero? Add them together and we get zero. So now here's the, here's the, the thing. Uh, so this one, this one is the group we were considering. Uh, this is a subgroup. That's a subgroup. Uh, this one is a subgroup. Uh, th that one was not. Uh, and this one is a subgroup. Okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, man. Uh, I'm going to fix this. <laughs> Look, I'll do it like this. I'll just. <laughs> well, I can only do what I can do. I, I already wrote the red in pen. Okay. <clears throat> so, what I want you to, to, to see. Is that what is the size? How many elements are in Z6? Six. six. And how many elements are in the subgroup that we called A? There's three. And how many elements are in the subgroup we called C? Two. And how many elements in the subgroup we called E? One. One. So this is just a single example, but can someone generalize this? Yes, every every subgroup, every subgroup. Uh, if you have a set, uh, and it is a subgroup, then it is then it is necessarily so that the number of elements in this subgroup divides the number of elements in uh, in in the parent group. So there's for those of you who have taken algebra, what's the name of this? It starts with L. Has anybody taken algebra? Yeah. So do we know this? The, the size of a subgroup must divide the size of the? Well, that, that's, that's somehow related a little bit, but. OK, well, at any rate, the observation, uh, the observation that if you have a group, so given a group <coughs> G, Given a group G and a subgroup H, uh, the way that you denote the number of elements uh, in a group is by writing absolute value bars on either side, which is just yet another meaning for absolute values uh, symbol. It must be the case that the number of elements in H is a divisor of the number of elements in G. Uh, now, the reason why that's significant, the reason why that's significant is because for these, these specific, these specific <coughs> groups, Z6, uh, how does, how does, how does 6 factor? Right, its factors are 1, 2, 3, and 6, right? So we can, we can throw out 1 and 6 as being trivial, uh, and, then it's, and then its factors, the, the non-trivial factors are 2 and 3. So... So what I want you to see is that factoring, 
factoring an integer can be somehow equivalent to asking about uh, the uh, a subgroup problem. Okay, so you if you wanted to factor some very very big number like 2370. Okay, well, you could consider this the 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 group Z2370, and and if you could find a subgroup, a proper subgroup, uh, then that would mean that you found uh, a a factor of 2370. Okay, so with that being the with that being the context, with that being the context. Now, oh, I forgot to even mention it, didn't I? Uh, the name the name of this. Uh, theorem that I'm just stating and not proving is called Lagrange's theorem. Do you understand that it's an implication? That is to say, if you have a subgroup, then the number of elements in that subgroup must divide the number of elements in that bigger group. But, but the converse of Lagrange's theorem is in general not true, which is to say that if you happen to have a group of size 10, say, uh, it, you, you may not necessarily have a subgroup of size 2, and there might not be a subgroup of size 5. OK, good. Uh, but that, 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 that's a situation for algebra. So now I'm going to, now I'm going to look at a, uh, a problem that might seem entirely uh, non sequitur, like, whoa, how did we move to here? But, but, but stick with me for a moment. I want you to consider the following example. Uh, I want you to consider the function uh, f of n is equal to uh, n squared plus 1. And then for definiteness, I'll say modulo 100. OK. <clears throat> So, and in particular, I want you, uh, I want you to view this, this set as having signature uh, from Z100 to Z100. That is to say, uh, you can plug in uh, naturals 0 through 99, uh, and then out comes another thing that's 0 through 99. Okay. <clears throat> uh, now, how many, how many possible outputs are there? there? There's just 100 different outputs, right? That, that's, all, that's all that there are. There aren't any more. Uh, so now, if I define, so uh, I'll make the definition. Uh, I'll define x0 equal to 0. So x0 is 0, <coughs> x1 will be f of x0, x2 will be f of x1, and generally, what will xk be? Right, f of x k minus 1. So what I'm saying is that we're going to generate a sequence of numbers. We're going to generate a sequence of numbers, and I'm just arbitrarily saying the first one is 0, and we're going to find the next one by, by plugging that into f and then writing that down. So now all of these exist in Z100. They all exist in Z100. So if we, if we were to start, calc if, if we're, we're going to calculate these, and, and if we do these, can you agree that eventually we must start repeating? Because if, if, we, if, we, if we go up to a million, say, well, there's only 100 possible outputs, so we must have started repeating somewhere. So let's do it. Uh, x0 is 0. Uh, what's x1? 1, because that would be 0 squared plus 1 and then modulo 100. Uh, x2, is it? It is, isn't it? Uh, x3. That's 5, right? Because it's, it's the previous one squared plus 1 and then modulo 100. Uh, x4, 26. x5, oh, this is tricky now, right? <laughs> Let me get my calculator, which I brought, because I knew it was going to come to this. OK, 28. 
26 squared plus 1 is 677. So what is 677 modulo 100? 77. <coughs> okay, so now 77 squared <coughs> plus 1 modulo 100. So 77 squared plus 1 is 5, is that number right there. So then what is that modulo 100? 30. <coughs> Okay, uh, 7, okay, 30 squared, oh wait, I can do this, right? <laughs> 30 squared is uh, 900, and then plus 1 is 901, and then modulo uh, 100 is 1, right? So here we are at 1. So now, without any, further, without any further calculator, I claim that you can do it from now on. Why can you do it from now on? Because do, do you observe that we found a one again? We found a one again, so it, it, you know, the the next one's going to be two. So just to be clear, this will be two, uh, and then five, and then twenty-six. Look at how fast I can do arithmetic, and then seventy-seven. <coughs> and then 30, etc. So what I want you to see, <coughs> what I want you to see is that uh, there's a repetition here. So in particular, uh, the, the, length, the length of this cycle is this. Okay, so that, that's one complete cycle. <coughs> and so, and here's another complete cycle. And if we were if we were to continue this procedure, it, we would just repeat this cycle from now on. Okay, uh, let's let's try this with uh, one, one other time, just to make sure we we understand it completely. Let's start it with a different x zero, but with the same uh, with the same iteration formula. So from from the crowd, what would you like for x zero to be? One? No, not one, because then it'll do. <laughs> <laughs> then it'll do this. None of these. Three. Okay. So what I mean by none of these is please don't select any that happen to be on this list. Okay. So let's try it again. So in this case, three squared plus one is ten. Modulo hundred is ten. Oh. <laughs> okay. Why did I say oh? Okay. So then ten squared plus one is one hundred and one. Modulo a hundred. <laughs> is one. So do, 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 do you observe that we would now that we would now do this? Okay, so uh, just just to be clear, blah blah four twenty six uh, twenty six squared no wait, that's not right. You skipped two. I skipped two. <laughs> two five twenty six Six, uh, seventy-seven is the next one, and then x seven is thirty. Okay, so uh, we we happened upon this exact same cycle again. Okay, <laughs> so we're gonna have to do it again because I'm trying to find something. So let's start. <laughs> let's start with uh, a different x zero that it, that hasn't appeared yet. Four. Okay, so we'll start with four. Uh, four squared plus one is seventeen. Modulo one is uh, modulo one hundred is seventeen. Good. Seventeen plus seventeen. Uh, seventeen times seventeen is two eighty nine. Plus one is two ninety. Modulo one hundred is ninety. Right. <laughs> Good. So we're get so far we're getting different numbers. Let me make sure about that seventeen. It's kind of early for me. Uh, yeah, okay, good. So then now 90 squared is a big number. Oh. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, fine. So <laughs> e e x3, 90 squared, that's 8100, and then add 1, that's 8100 and 1, and then modulo 100 is 1. 
Okay. Do you see that we keep getting uh, caught in this, this cycle? Now, now it's, just a, it's just a coincidence that we keep getting caught, caught in this cycle because there are others. Okay, but we just haven't found them. But I promise you that if we were to sit here and do this, we'd find other cycles. Okay, but but it, it's enough. If, if you can just uh, believe, let, so let me finish copying this down to five, six, no, five and then 26, uh, and then seven, 77, and then 30. Okay. So we keep getting caught in this cycle. <clears throat> but what I, what I would like for you to see is that there's this little bit at the front, this little bit at the front that's not part of the cycle. <coughs> right, we got these, these novel numbers and then we start entering into this cycle. Uh, now here's, here's the question that, that w we're first going to tackle. Uh, okay, how, will we, how can we detect when we've entered the cycle? So one way to do it, one way to do it is to record all of the things. So you could record all of them, and then just every time you make a new one, you could ask, have I already written that one down? So you, you could do it in this way. Uh, and for, for uh, a set of size 100 on MATLAB, that's reasonable, because all, all day long you can make you can make vectors that have 100 elements in them. But now let's imagine that we have, that we have uh, a, a sequence that could be quite large. And I mean really, really large. Like, say, on the order of 2 to 64. Now, 2 to 64 is an enormous number. It, it, it's just an inconceivably large, not, not inconceivable, but, but it's just an extremely large number. So if we had a cycle uh, that was, that was uh, very, very long, then, it could, then it's easy to come up with a case where you couldn't possibly record enough of them to see if you're, if, if you, when you actually come to a repeat. Because the amount of memory that b would be required to just write down every single one exceeds the main memory on the computer. So like the computers in the, in the lab probably have on the order of eight gigabytes of RAM. So I can very easily give you, give you one of these uh, where, where the length of, of the cycle that you want to compute exceeds eight gigabytes of data. So, so the question is, the question stands, how could we detect that we're on the cycle it, if it's prohibitive, prohibitively expensive to keep track of all the numbers that we've generated? Okay, so I, I like that observation. So I, I think what you're saying is that uh, every time it 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 happened that one of these became one of these became a multiple of ten, we immediately the, the next the next one was necessarily going to be one. So notice that when we got to thirty, then it was one. Similarly, when we got to ninety, it was one. And if somehow we could <coughs> find a different a different uh, a different way that we could get to say 50. Well, 50 squared is 2,500 plus one is 2,501 modulo 100 is one. So every time that we come to a multiple of 10, we're going to enter this cycle. But here's the, and, and that's a good observation, <laughs> but here's the thing. What if I say Z, Z uh, K, where K is just an enormous number and you have no idea what the factors are? You have no idea whatsoever. Ah, so, so you started with 8, and then you, you entered the cycle <laughs> on 26. Okay, so that's interesting. Okay, is that right? Yeah, well, okay. So somehow, somehow you did it. So, okay. Now, what I'm telling you is that uh, the, 
the, the, the modulus here in this problem is 100. Now, that's small enough to where we can think about it. What I'm saying is that what if you have a, mod a modulus that is so big you couldn't possibly factor it, so you wouldn't be able to use that observation? What would you do? How could you do it? Hmm. This one's, it's, it's actually really, really difficult to, to come up with a novel solution. But there is one that doesn't require you memorizing anything. Um, not, not, not necessarily, but it, it'll depend on, it depends in, in the, in, in the end on, on which function you happen to be using here and which modulus you're using. But then that just raises the question further, is that what if you're doing this and, you know, you're talking about a, a number like X8 is some number that has, say, 10 million digits in it. Is it prime? <laughs> Who knows, right? <laughs> Could be. Okay, so here's, here's the, so does everyone understand the question? How to detect when you've gotten onto the cycle? And notice, for, no, notice also that, there, that you've got this little bit here, and this could be who knows how long. So what I want you to see, what I want you to see is that, is that sort of metaphorically, metaphorically the way this, this problem goes, the way this problem goes is you've got this green bit at the front, they could have any kind of length that we're not sure, <coughs> and then you enter, enter the red bit, and it's a cycle. So I'll, I'll draw it as a loop. So once you, once you, uh, once you traverse the green part and enter the loop, you'll be on the loop from now on. Okay, and then if you if you look at this uh, like that, that kind of looks just a little bit like uh, a Greek letter. What Greek letter? Rho. This looks like Greek letter rho. So what, what we're talking about, what we're talking about is something related to, if you get interested uh, and you want to look this up, this is about Pollard's rho function. Okay, so here's the idea. We're going to start, we're going to start, uh, so we, we agree, you know, we did three different runs, but we agreed on each one that this one's going to start here or that one's going to start here. So we're going to start, uh, we're going to start a tortoise, a slow moving creature right here. So the slow moving creature is going to, uh, is going to step one at a time. So step, 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 step. So the tortoise is stepping one at a time. Uh, then at the, at the same time as the tortoise, we're going to start the hare, okay, a faster, a faster moving creature. And the, the hare, so the, the tortoise does one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time. But because the, because the hare is faster, it's going to take two steps. So it's going to take two steps. The hare will go uh, this one, that one. And then the next one. Uh, so, did I do that right? Yeah. No, that's not even close to right. My goodness. No, that is right. One, two. Yeah. And then, okay. Good. <laughs> so, so who's gonna who's gonna get to the loop first? The hare is going to get to the loop first, right? And unless unless the green the run the green run up is is empty, right? But but can we agree that in in a finite number of steps both of them will reach the loop? In some in some finite number of steps, they'll both reach the loop. So now what I want you to imagine is that we I take the loop this loop and I unroll it and I make it flat. And understand that this the the next step from the right end takes you to the left end. So there's going to be a there's going to be a time when the tortoise first enters the loop. So for example here, that is to say when you first the first time you get 1 for this particular cycle. <laughs> now, by the time the tortoise enters the loop, the hare has already been on the loop for potentially a long time depending how how long the green run up was. 
So let's say that the tortoise is, uh, say, right here. Oh, sorry, the, the hare is right here. And by hare, I mean a rabbit, right? In, ca in case that wasn't clear. Okay, so they're both on the loop. They're both on the loop, and they're still going to be traveling it at their, at their different speeds. Okay, so uh, now the, the, the hare's traveling faster. Eventually, the hare's going to lap the tortoise. It's going to come all the way back around. So let's say, just for sake of argument, that the distance from the hare to the tortoise, the forward distance from the hare to the tortoise, uh, that is to say, at, at, at this particular point, is, uh, is k. So after one step, uh, that is, that is each one of them does, each one of them performs their one action. That means the tortoise moves forward one, and the hare moves forward two. So after one step, what will be the distance between them? K minus one. They'll be one position closer. And then after two steps, their distance will be K minus two, and then K minus three, all the way down to zero. That is where they find themselves at the same position. Ah, well. What does that, then what does that mean if, you, if, if the tortoise and hare ever find themselves at the same position? You must be in the loop. There's no way, because uh, on, this, on, this part of the, on this part of the structure, there's no way the tortoise and the hare could find themselves at the same position except at the beginning, right? There's no way they could find themselves at the same position unless they were on the loop. Okay, so does everyone understand how to, how to detect that you are on the loop? Okay, now uh, th that is to say when the tortoise and hare collide. <coughs> now there's a separate question. Uh, suppose we generate this sequence of values. So this is, this is the tail part of the sequence. And this is the uh, this is the looped part of the sequence. Now there's two questions: Is that when do you when do you first enter the loop? Right. That is so. So we've 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 said how you can detect that you are in fact in the loop. Uh, now the question is, is wh where is this? Where do you transition? Where do you take the first step into the loop off of the tail? So that's a different question. Okay, so we're going to call this position uh, position mu. So in particular, this position right here <coughs> will be x0 and then x1 dot dot dot. This, this last position we'll call x mu minus 1. And then this position, the first place where you are in the loop, is x mu. In principle, yes. In principle, uh, x0 could be x, mu, mu could be 0, yes. Because, for example, on, on this thing, you know, I said, well, let's start at zero. Then I said, okay, well, let's start at three. Okay, if I said, let's start at one, then we'd be then there, the 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 tail would be empty. <coughs> okay, uh, let's let's uh, say furthermore that the number of positions that are in that are actually in the loop, let's say that uh, the that the loop has a, a definite length. Let's call that uh, lambda. For, for length. <clears throat> so that means that the position next to x mu, this would be x mu plus 1, and then x mu plus 2, and then what would be the last position? x mu plus lambda. No, will that be right? No, that wouldn't be the last one. Mu plus 
plus lambda minus one. Mu plus lambda minus one, right? Because if, if say, imagine your ceiling fan, what is the length of the cycle of your ceiling fan? Four, right? If you go up to your ceiling fan and then give it four quick clicks, click, 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 then besides the little bit of energy that, that were imparted to the blades, the fan will be in the same state. So that means to get to the last position, if you're in the first position, position zero, off, to get to the last one, you have to do three clicks, one less. So this would be uh, mu uh, plus lambda minus one. So what I want you to see from this is that as we're, as we're computing, as we're computing uh, se sequence values, it is the case that x mu is equal to uh, x mu plus lambda, uh, oops, x mu plus lambda, <coughs> but this is, uh, this is true once you get into the cycle, once you get into the cycle, but do you observe that even if we happen to be, say, right here, for sake of argument, let's say that this is some xi, can we also agree <coughs> that uh, xi is equal to xi plus lambda, but only when what? <coughs> so there has to be something true about i. Is greater than mu. Greater than or equal to mu. That is to say that you'll, you'll start noticing the repetitions of size lambda once you, pass, once you pass the tail. If I was to select an xi over here, it wouldn't be true. OK. So the de to detect uh, that you're in the loop, what you're checking for is you want to find when xi, that's the tortoise, is equal to x2i. That's the hair. That is to say, when the tortoise and the hair collide. OK, when, when you detect this, when you detect this, then uh, once you detect this, we know the following things. We know, once this is true, that mu is less or equal to i. Mu is less or equal to i. And uh, furthermore, and, uh, what am I trying to say? So, uh, be because of this, i is equal, well, xi is equal to xi plus lambda, we can make a further observation about 2i and i. So what? So this is saying we know we must have entered the loop. And what else? Hmm. So maybe maybe it'll help. Maybe it'll help if I if I. Uh, so do we? Once we enter the loop, xi is equal to is equal to xi plus lambda. But isn't it also true that xi is equal to xi plus any multiple of lambda? So now we now I'm asking for you to to, to uh, combine these two ideas. So this is this is the lambda is a factor of i. L okay, lambda is lambda is a is a factor of i. So that's this is saying 
this is saying, uh, t taking these two together, uh, 2i must be equal to i plus some multiple of lambda. Okay, then we can subtract i from both sides and obtain that i is k lambda. Ah, so that means that when you first detect that you've entered the cycle, when you first detect that you've entered the cycle, uh, the position when you first detect the cycle must be divisible divisible by lambda must be divisible by lambda. <clears throat> so let's call this first position so we need to give it a name. So what do you want to call this first position where we where the where the where the hair is? I'm sorry, where the tortoise is where you first collide with the hair. Yeah, just so just so we can give it some so so I can refer to it unambiguously. S. Okay, S. Let's call this first position S. That is to say that that's the first time that this that this equation is is satisfied. XS is X twice S. Okay. <clears throat> so now what we want to do is we want to we want to find where is mu? And what we have <coughs> what we have is we've got this tail bit and we don't know how long the tail is. And we've got the cycle bit and we don't know how long the cycle is. But we first noticed, <laughs> we first noticed that there was a collision right here at XS. And we know uh, that lambda divides S and that the length of the cycle is lambda. So how can we, <coughs> pardon me, how can we, uh, how can we figure out where mu is from here? So it's kind of difficult because when I draw a picture for you, on the one hand, you want to just say, it's right there. <laughs> you got to think about how you, could, how you can do this. Hmm. Ah, I, I agree, but what I'm, I, I agree in principle that you could go that way, but I'm, 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 I'm telling you that we're not allowed to perform division because the, 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 the process of actually computing, fa what I mean, division is fine, but we're not allowed to factor S because that's prohibitively expensive. So S is a number that's, cons that's potentially so big that you just couldn't possibly factor it in any reasonable amount of time. What can we do? What can we do? We don't know what lambda is. So, w yes? We can find what lambda is pretty easily, though, right? In what way? Uh, by, by, of 
recording what value you have at wherever they meet and then <coughs> counting how long it takes to get to that same value. Okay. Because so that, that doesn't scale with the length of the loop. That just, like, memory-wise, it doesn't scale. Right. Because you have to store one value. So I, I think what you're saying is that, okay, once we detect the collision, we could record this value mm -hmm. and, then, and then let the tortoise keep running mm -hmm. and go all the way through and count how, how many steps did the tortoise have to take to come back. Mm -hmm. I agree that that would be a way to calculate lambda. Uh, but that wouldn't tell us where mu is. It wouldn't tell us where mu is. And okay. we're, right now we're trying to find mu. But I agree that... that that is a way, and in fact, the way we'll calcul calculate lambda. But right now, we want mu. Uh, no, because uh, you don't know, how, b because s, s could potentially be very big. So s is, s is the place where the tortoise and the hare actually collided. So it's conceivable that the length of the loop is a billion, or something like that but that the tortoise and the hare didn't end up colliding until uh, hundreds of billions. Because, because you don't know how long the tail was, you don't know where the tortoise and the hare were when the tortoise first entered the, the loop. So for example, the tortoise could have entered the loop exactly one behind the hare. And then they get further and further and further and further apart until the hare comes all, all the way back around. So could you just so you've got the, the second thing between the very beginning and S, right? Could you just binary search through that and, and for each value see if it's part of the loop or not? Well, in order, I'm not, I, I don't think so, because in order to do a binary search, you'd have to record a bunch of values. Well, well you would go through You wouldn't have to record anything because for each value that you want to check, you move the turtle through lambda one. So, so you check at the middle and you move the turtle lambda to see if it's equal to any of those values. And if it's not equal, then you know that mu is to the right of that value. And if it is, then you know it's to the left for that value. And that way you can split up the, the domain into halves. I'm not sure I'm following. I'm not sure I'm following. Okay, so let's 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 try this. So what if we start? What if we start uh, a third runner now? So we so far we have two runners. We've got the tortoise and the hare. Right, the tortoise and the hare is how we how we uh, detected the collision. Okay, this one is at uh, position S. The tortoise is. And position S is divisible by lambda. Position S is divisible by lambda. Let's start, let's start a new runner right here at x0. And suppose that we make them both run. We b make them both run at speed 1. So now we have two tortoises, or torti, or I'm not sure how you say that. Tortoises? OK. <laughs> so, so as soon as we find, as soon as we notice the collision, then now we've got two runners. One is at x0 and one is at xs. And notably, the distance between these two runners, the distance between these two runners is, is, is divisible by lambda. Okay, because what's the distance between these runners right now? S, and S is divisible by lambda. Uh, so what I what I want you to see is that s minus zero uh, is divisible by lambda. So if we move this one forward one position to x one, and this one to x s one, so they both take one step now. They're both traveling at the same speed. Can, what's the distance between them now? Still s, right? Still s, still divisible by lambda. Okay. Okay. So now, <coughs> now we need to try and think about what uh, what will happen. <coughs> Actually, 
well, uh, th th this runner will ne necessarily has to enter the loop eventually, right? So the, the runner that started back at the beginning. And this one's already in the loop, so it's just running around in the loop. Okay? So there's going to come a time, <coughs> there's going to come a time when x0 first enters the loop, and what's the name of that index that we gave to the, to, to the first time you entered the loop? x mu. So there's a time where you are at x mu. And it, that's the first runner. And then, then the original tortoise, what's their position? S plus mu. Okay, and again, the, the, uh, the distance between them is, is uh, divisible by lambda. It's S. So now I claim that, I claim that, we, can, that we can detect this. So how can we detect this? <clears throat> so d can we agree that we, we want to detect this position? So what, why would they be equal? Uh, because the, the, the separation between them initially was a multiple of lambda. Uh -huh. So by the time that it enters the loop, it'll still be a multiple of lambda. That's right, because it's at all times, they're, they're at all times lambda apart. So, so that's the same as looping, you know, the, It'll be the same thing in the. It'll be the same yeah. position in the loop. Yeah. That's ex That's exactly right. So the way that you detect this is that at at mu it will be the case that x mu is x s plus mu, because please on a loop that has length lambda. On a loop that has length lambda, what does it mean to be exactly lambda apart? That means to be exactly in the same position, right? So if you, that is to say, if you're on a circle, and if you're at, if you're at angle zero, where we all imagine the, the usual convention of angle zero is, and then you travel around two pi radians, where are you? Zero. Same position. Ah, so if you take, if you take the, the place of first collision, that's wh how you can tell that you're on the loop, and then you start a second tortoise at the beginning, and let them run around, all you have to do is let the two torti run, and the first place, the first place that they collide, that's the beginning of the loop. That's the beginning of the loop. Okay, so now, now we know how to detect that we're in a loop, we know how to detect, how to detect the beginning of the loop, now finally, the, the, the relatively easy part, how do you detect the length of the loop? Yes? Just because they collide, that doesn't necessarily mean, that doesn't mean that it's the beginning of the loop. Because be they collide within because, be, uh, because what, you, what you're doing is that, is that you start the second tortoise out here on the tail. So they're out here on the tail, and there's step, 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 step. Do you agree that this second tortoise will, will have a first time that it steps into the loop? It will have a first time that it steps into the loop, and we're naming we, we've we've uh, we've named that position mu. So what I'm saying is that you you run you run the original tortoise and the second tortoise, and you just keep running them. And this one will step into the loop the first time, and it is necessarily the case that when the second tortoise steps for the first time into the loop. It will be. It will collide with the first tortoise. And in fact, they'll be in the same position from now on. You'll have, t you know, two tortoises running side by side from from now on. I, I I agree that that 
from, from now on, these will be in agreement. Their, their values will be. Okay, so then finally, so we know, we know how to detect when we're in the loop. We know how to detect the beginning of the loop. How do we detect the length of the loop? Right. You could say, now you have two torti. You just keep one of them still, just leave it still, and then let the other one walk all the way around the loop, and you count how many steps did it have to take. Okay, then from here, from mu, uh, lambda is computable. Uh, by solving uh, x mu, that is to say, let one of the, let that tortoise stay still, <coughs> is uh, x mu plus lambda, and we solve this for lambda. And we ran out of time, more or less, but so so we just won't get to it. But I'll I'll tell you that that uh, this this particular so this thing that we did is called a, is called a cycle finding algorithm. So specifically, the name of this is Floyd's cycle finding algorithm. And and fast Im implementations of Floyd's cycle finding algorithm are at the at the heart of of attempts to factor large integers. Okay, good. So uh, this will be the last new math topic that we talk about. We'll, we'll meet in the lab every Tuesday and Thursday from now on.